Part two, sections one through three of All Things Are Possible by Lev Shestov. Section one. Light reveals to us beauty, but also ugliness. Throw vitriol in the face of a beautiful woman, and the beauty is gone. No power on earth will enable us to look upon her with the same rapture as before. Could even the sincerest, deepest love endure the change? True, the idealist will hasten to say that love overcomes all things. But idealism needs be prompt, for if she leaves us one single moment in which to see, we shall see such things as are not easily explained away. That is why idealists stick so tight to logic. In the twinkling of an eye, logic will convey us to the remotest conclusions and forecasts reality could never overtake her love is eternal and consequently a disfigured face will seem as lovely to us as a fresh one this is of course a lie but it helps to preserve the old tastes and obscures danger real danger however was never dispelled by words in spite of schiller and eternal love in the long run vitriol triumphs and the agreeable young man is forced to abandon his beloved and acknowledge himself a fraud light the source of his life and hope has now destroyed hope and life for him he will not return to idealism and he will hate logic light that seemed to him so beautiful will have become hideous he will turn to darkness where logic and its binding conclusions have no power but where the fancy is free for all her vagaries without light we should never have known that vitriol ruins beauty no science nor any art can give us what darkness gives it is true in our young days when all was new light brought us great happiness and joy let us therefore remember it with gratitude as a benefactor we no longer need do after all let us dispense with gratitude for it belongs to the calculating bourgeois virtues do ut des let us forget light and gratitude and the qualms of self-important idealism let us go bravely to meet the coming night she promises us great power over reality is it worth while to give up our old tastes and lofty convictions love and light have not availed against vitriol what a horror would have seized us at the thought once upon a time that short phrase can annul all schiller we have shut our eyes and stopped our ears we have built huge philosophic systems to shield us from this tiny thought and now now it seems we have no more feeling for schiller and the great systems we have no pity on our past beliefs we now are seeking for words with which to sing the praises of our former enemy night the dark deaf impenetrable night peopled with horrors does she not now loom before us infinitely beautiful does she not draw us with her still mysterious fathomless beauty far more powerfully than noisy narrow day it seems as if in a short while man will feel that the same incomprehensible cherishing power which threw us out into the universe and set us like plants to reach to the light is now gradually transferring us to a new direction where a new life awaits us with all its stores fata volentem ducunt nolentem trahunt and perhaps the time is near when the impassioned poet casting a last look to his past will boldly and gladly cry hide thyself son o darkness be welcome two psychology at last leads us to conclude that the most generous human impulses spring from a root of egoism tolstoy's love to one's neighbor for example proves to be a branch of the old self-love the same may be said of kant's idealism and even of plato's though they glorify the service of the idea in practice they succeed in getting out of the vicious circle of egoism no better than the ordinary mortal who is neither a genius nor a flower of culture in my eyes this is almost an absolute truth it is never wrong to add the retractive almost truth is too much inclined to exaggerate its own importance and one must guard oneself against its despotic authority thus all men are egoists hence follows a great deal i even think this proposition might provide better grounds for metaphysical conclusions than the doubtful capacity for compassion and love for one's neighbour which has been so tempting to dogma for some reason men have imagined that love for oneself 
is more natural and comprehensible than love for another why love for others is only a little rarer less widely diffused than love to oneself but then hippopotami and rhinoceros even in their own tropical regions are less frequent than horses and mules does it follow that they are less natural and transcendental positivism is not incumbent upon bloodthirsty savages nay as we know many of them are less positive-minded than our learned men for instance a future life is to them such an infallible reality that they even enter into contracts part of which is to be fulfilled in the next world a german metaphysician won't go as far as that hence it follows that the way to know the other world is not by any means through love sympathy and self-denial as schopenhauer taught on the contrary it appears as if love for others were only an impediment to metaphysical flights love and sympathy chain the eye to the misery of this earth where such a wide field for active charity opens out the materialists were mostly very good men a fact which bothered the historians of philosophy they preached matter believed in nothing and were ready to perform all kinds of sacrifices for their neighbors how is this it is a case of clearest logical consequence man loves his neighbor he sees that heaven is indifferent to misery therefore he takes upon himself the role of providence were he indifferent to the sufferings of others he would easily become an idealist and leave his neighbors to their fate love and compassion kill belief and make a man a positivist and a materialist in his philosophical outlook if he feels the misery of others he leaves off meditating and wants to act man only thinks properly when he realizes he has nothing to do his hands are tied that is why any profound thought must arise from despair optimism on the other hand the readiness to jump hastily from one conclusion to another may be regarded as an inevitable sign of narrow self-sufficiency which dreads doubt and is consequently always superficial if a man offers you a solution of eternal questions it shows he has not even begun to think about them he has only acted perhaps it is not necessary to think who can say how we ought or ought not to live and how could we be brought to live as we ought when our own nature is and always will be an incalculable mystery there is no mistake about it nobody wants to think i do not speak here of logical thinking that like any other natural function gives man great pleasure for this reason philosophical systems however complicated arouse real and permanent interest in the public provided they only require from man the logical exercise of the mind and nothing else but to think really to think surely this means a relinquishing of logic it means living a new life it means a permanent sacrifice of the dearest habits tastes attachments without even the assurance that the sacrifice will bring any compensation artists and philosophers like to imagine the thinker with a stern face a profound look which penetrates into the unseen and a noble bearing an eagle preparing for flight not at all a thinking man is one who has lost his balance in the vulgar not in the tragic sense hands raking the air feet flying face scared and bewildered he is a caricature of helplessness and pitiable perplexity look at the aged turgenev his poems and prose and his letter to tolstoy maupassant thus tells of his meeting with turgenev there entered a giant with a silvery head quite so the majestic patriarch and master of course the myth of giants with silver locks is firmly established in the heart of man then suddenly enters turgenev in his prose poems pale pitiful fluttering like a bird that has been winged turgenev who has taught us everything how can he be so fluttered and bewildered how could he write his letter to tolstoy did he not know that tolstoy was finished the source of his creative activity dried up that he must seek other activities of course he knew and still he wrote that letter but it was not for tolstoy nor even for russian literature which of course is not kept going by the deathbed letters and covenants of its giants in the dreadful moments of the end turgenev in spite of his noble size and silver locks did not know what to say or where to look for support and consolation so he turned to literature to which he had given his life 
he yearned that she whom he had served so long and loyally should just once help him save him from the horrible and thrice senseless nightmare he stretched out his withered numbing hands to the printed sheets which still preserved the traces of the soul of the living suffering man he addressed his late enemy tolstoy with the most flattering name great writer of the russian land recollected that he was his contemporary that he himself was a great writer of the russian land but this he did not express aloud he only said i can no longer he praised a strict school of literary and general education to the last he tried to preserve his bearing of a giant with silvery locks and we were gratified the same persons who are indignant at gogol's correspondence quote turgenev's letter with reverence the attitude is everything turgenev knew how to pose passably well and this is ascribed to him as his greatest merit mundus vult decipi ergo decipiatur but gogol and turgenev felt substantially the same had turgenev burnt his own manuscripts and talked of himself instead of tolstoy before death he would have been accounted mad moralists would have reproached him for his display of extreme egoism and philosophy philosophy seems to be getting rid of certain prejudices at the moment when men are least likely to play the hypocrite and lie to themselves turgenev and gogol place their personal fate higher than the destinies of russian literature does not this betray a secret to us ought we not to see in absolute egoism an inalienable and great yes very great quality of human nature psychology ignoring the threats of morality has led us to a new knowledge yet still in spite of the instances we have given the mass of people will as usual see nothing but malice in every attempt to reveal the human impulses that underlie lofty motives to be merely men seems humiliating to men so now malice will also be detected in my interpretation of turgenev's letter no matter what assurance i offer to the contrary three on method a certain naturalist made the following experiment a glass jar was divided into two halves by a perfectly transparent glass partition on the one side of the partition he placed a pike on the other a number of small fishes such as formed the prey of the pike the pike did not notice the partition and hurled itself on its prey with of course the result only of a bruised nose the same happened many times and always the same result at last seeing all its efforts ended so painfully the pike abandoned the hunt so that in a few days when the partition had been removed it continued to swim about among the small fry without daring to attack them does not the same happen with us perhaps the limits between this world and the other world are also essentially of an experimental origin either rooted in the nature of things as was thought before kant or in the nature of our reason as was thought after kant perhaps indeed a partition does exist and make vain all attempts to cross over but perhaps there comes a moment when the partition is removed in our minds however the conviction is firmly rooted that it is impossible to pass certain limits and painful to try a conviction founded on experience but in this case we should recall the old scepticism of hume which idealist philosophy has regarded as mere subtle mind-play valueless after kant's critique the most lasting and varied experience cannot lead to any binding and universal conclusion nay all our a priori which are so useful for a certain time become sooner or later extremely harmful a philosopher should not be afraid of scepticism but should go on bruising his jaw perhaps the failure of metaphysics lies in the caution and timidity of metaphysicians who seem ostensibly so brave they have sought for rest which they describe as the highest boon whereas they should have valued more than anything restlessness aimlessness even purposelessness how can you tell when the partition will be removed perhaps at the very moment when man ceased his painful pursuit settled all his questions and rested on his laurels inert he could with one strong push have swept through the pernicious fence which separated him from the unknowable there is no need for man to move according to a carefully considered plan this is a purely aesthetic demand which need not bind us 
let man senselessly and deliriously knock his head against the wall if the wall go down at last will he value his triumph any the less unfortunately for us the illusion has been established in us that plan and purpose are the best guarantee of success what a delusion it is the opposite is true the best of all that genius has revealed to us has been revealed as the result of fantastic erratic apparently ridiculous and useless but relentlessly stubborn seeking columbus tired of sitting on the same spot sailed west to look for india and genius in spite of vulgar conception is a condition of chaos and unutterable restlessness not for nothing has genius been counted kin to madness genius flings itself hither and thither because it has not the zitzfleisch necessary for industrious success in mediocrity we may be sure that earth has seen much more genius than history has recorded since genius is acknowledged only when it has been serviceable when the tossing about has led to no useful issue which is the case in the majority of instances it arouses only a feeling of disgust and abomination in all witnesses he can't rest and he can't let others rest if lermontov and dostoevsky had lived in times when there was no demand for books nobody would have noticed them lermontov's early death would have passed unregretted perhaps some settled and virtuous citizen would have remarked weary of the young man's eternal and dangerous freaks for a dog a dog's death the same of gogol tolstoy pushkin now they are praised because they left interesting books and so we need pay no attention to the cry about the futility and worthlessness of scepticism even scepticism pure and unadulterated scepticism which has no ulterior motive of clearing the way for a new creed to knock one's head against the wall out of hatred for the wall to beat against established and obstructive ideas because one detests them is it not an attractive proposition and then to see ahead uncertainly and limitless possibilities instead of up-to-date ideals is not this too fascinating the highest good is rest i shall not argue de gustibus aut nihil aut bene by the way isn't it a superb principle and this superb principle has been arrived at perfectly by chance unfortunately not by me but by one of the comical characters in chekhov's seagull he mixed up two latin proverbs and the result was a splendid maxim which in order to become an a priori awaits only universal acceptance end of part two section three part two sections four through nine of all things are possible by lev shestov section four metaphysicians praise the transcendental and carefully avoid it nietzsche hated metaphysics he praised the earth like nur der erde treu o meine bruder and always lived in the realm of the transcendental of course the metaphysicians behave better this is indisputable he who would be a teacher must proclaim the metaphysical point of view and he may become a hero without ever smelling powder in these anxious days when positivism seems to fall short one cannot do better than turn to metaphysics then the young man need not any more envy alexander the macedonian with the assistance of a few books not only earthly states are conquered but the whole mysterious universe metaphysics is the great art of swerving round dangerous experience so metaphysicians should be called the positivists par excellence they do not despise all experience as they assert but only the dangerous experiences they adapt the safest of all methods of self-defense what the english call protective mimicry let us repeat to all students professors know it already he who would be a sincere metaphysician must avoid risky experience schiller once asked how can tragedy give delight the answer to put it in our own words was if we are to obtain delight from tragedy it must be seen only upon the stage in order to love the transcendental it also should be known only from the stage or from books of the philosophers this is called idealism the nicest word ever invented by philosophizing men five poetai nascuntur wonderful is man knowing nothing about it he asserts the existence of an objective impossibility 
even a little while ago before the invention of the telephone and telegraph men would have declared it impossible for europe to converse with america now it is possible we cannot produce poets therefore we say they are born certainly we cannot make a child a poet by forcing him to study literary models from the most ancient to the most modern neither will anybody hear us in america no matter how loud we shout here to make a poet of a man he must not be developed along ordinary lines perhaps books should be kept from him perhaps it is necessary to perform some apparently dangerous operation on him fracture his skull or throw him out of a fourth-story window i will refrain from recommending these methods as a substitute for pedagogy but that is not the point look at the great men and the poets except john stuart mill and a couple of other positivist thinkers who had learned fathers and virtuous mothers none of the great men can boast of or better complain of a proper upbringing in their lives nearly always the decisive part was played by accident accident which reason would dub meaninglessness if reason ever dared raise its voice against obvious success something like a broken skull or a fall from the fourth floor not metaphorically but often absolutely literally has proved the commencement usually concealed but occasionally avowed of the activity of genius but we repeat automatically poetae nascuntur and are deeply convinced that this extraordinary truth is so lofty it needs no verification six until apollo calls him to the sacrifice ignobly the poet is plunged in the cares of this shoddy world silent is his lyre cold sleeps his soul of all the petty children of earth most petty it seems is he Bissarioff, the critic was exasperated by these verses presumably if they had not belonged to pushkin all the critics along with pisaryov would have condemned them and their author to oblivion suspicious verse before apollo calls to him the poet is the most insignificant of mortals in his free hours the ordinary man finds some more or less distinguished distraction for himself he hunts attends exhibitions of pictures or the theatre and finally rests in the bosom of his family but the poet is incapable of normal existence immediately he has finished with apollo forgetting all about altars and sacrifices he proceeds to occupy himself with unworthy objects or he abandons himself to the dolce far niente the customary pastime of all favourites of the muses let us here remark that not only all poets but all writers and artists in general are inclined to lead bad lives think what tolstoy tells us in confession and elsewhere of the best representatives of literature in the fifties on the whole it is just as pushkin says in his verses whilst he is engaged in composition an author is a creature of some consequence apart from this he is nothing why are apollo and the muses so remiss why do they draw to themselves wayward or vicious votaries instead of rewarding virtue we dare not suspect the gods even the dethroned of bad intentions apollo loved virtuous persons and yet virtuous persons are evidently mediocre and unfit for the sacred offices if any man is overcome with a great desire to serve the god of song let him get rid of his virtues at once curious that this truth is so completely unknown to men they think that through virtue they can truly deserve the favour and choice of apollo and since industry is the first virtue they peg away morning noon and night of course the more they work the less they do which really puzzles and annoys them they even fling aside the sacred arts and all the labours of a devotee they give themselves up to idleness and other bad habits and sometimes it so happens that just as a man decides that it is all no good the muses suddenly visit him so it was with dostoevsky and others schiller alone managed to get round apollo but perhaps it was only his biographers he got round germans are so trustful so easy to deceive the biographers saw nothing unusual in schiller's habit of keeping his feet in cold water whilst he worked no doubt they felt that if the divine poet had lived in the sahara where water is precious as gold and the inspired cannot take a foot-bath every day then the speeches of the marquis of pola would have lacked half their nobleness at least and apparently schiller was not so wonderfully chaste if he needed such artificial resources in the composition of his fine speeches 
in a word we must believe pushkin a poet is on the one hand among the elect on the other hand he is one of the most insignificant of mortals hence we can draw a very consoling conclusion the most insignificant of men are not altogether so worthless as we imagine they may not be fit to occupy government positions or professorial chairs but they are often extremely at home on parnassus and such high places apollo rewards vice and virtue as everybody knows is so satisfied with herself she needs no reward then why do the pessimists lament leibnitz was quite right we live in the best possible of worlds i would even suggest that we leave out the modification possible seven it is das ewig weibliche with russian writers pushkin and lermontov loved women and were not afraid of them who trusted his own nature was often in love and always sang his love of the moment when infatuated with a bacchante he glorified bacchantes when he married he warbled of a modest nun-like beauty his wife a synthesizing mind would probably not know what to do with all pushkin's sorts of love nor is lermontov any better he abused women but as bielinski observed after meeting him he loved women more than anything in the world and again not women of one mould only any and all attractive females the wild bella the lovely mary tamar one and all no matter of what race or condition every time lermontov is in love he assures us his love is so deep and ardent and even moral that we cannot judge him without compunction vladimir solovyov alone was not afraid to condemn him he brought pushkin as well as lermontov to account for their moral irregularities and he even went so far as to say that it was not he himself who judged them but fate in whose service he acted as public denouncer lermontov and pushkin both dying young had deserved death for their frivolities but there was nobody else besides vladimir solovyov to darken the memories of the two poets it is true tolstoy cannot forgive pushkin's dissolute life but he does not apply to fate for a verdict according to tolstoy morality can cope even with a titan like pushkin in tolstoy's view morality grows stronger the harder the job it has to tackle it pardons the weak offenders without waste of words but it never forgives pride and self-confidence if tolstoy's edicts had been executed all memorials to pushkin would have disappeared chiefly because of the poet's addiction to the eternal female in such a case tolstoy is implacable he admits the kind of love whose object is the establishing of a family but no more don juan is a hateful transgressor think of levine and his attitude to prostitutes he is exasperated indignant even forgets the need for compassion and calls them beasts in the eternal female tolstoy sees temptation seduction sin great danger therefore it is necessary to keep quite away from the danger but surely danger is the dragon which guards every treasure on earth and again no matter what his precautions a man will meet his fate sooner or later and come into conflict with the dragon surely this is an axiom pushkin and lermontov loved danger and therefore sought women they paid a heavy price but while they lived they lived freely and lightly if they had cared to peep in the book of destinies they might have averted or avoided their sad end but they preferred to trust their star lucky or unlucky tolstoy was the first among us we cannot speak of gogol who began to fear life he was the first to start open moralizing in so far as public opinion and personal dignity demand it he did go to meet his dangers but not a step further so he avoided women art and philosophy love per se that is love which does not lead to a family like wisdom per se which is wisdom that has no utilitarian motive and like art for art's sake seemed to him the worst of temptations leading to the destruction of the soul when he plunged too deep in thinking he was seized with panic it seemed to me i was going mad so i went away to the bashkirs for kumis such confessions are common in his works and surely there is no other way with temptations than to cut short at once before it is too late tolstoy preserved himself on account of his inborn instinct for departing betimes from a dangerous situation 
save for this cautious prompting he would probably have ended like lermontov or pushkin true he might have gone deeper into nature and revealed us rare secrets instead of preaching at us abstinence humility simplicity and so on but such luck fell to the fate of dostoevsky dostoevsky had very muddled relations with morality he was too racked by disease and circumstance to get much profit out of the rules of morality the hygiene of the soul like that of the body is beneficial only to healthy men to the sick it is simply harmful the more dostoevsky engaged himself with high morality the more inextricably entangled he became he wanted to respect the personality in a woman and only the personality and so he came to the point where he could not look on any woman however ugly with indifference the elder karamazov and his affair with elizabeth smerdyasha stinking lizzie in what other imagination could such a union have been contemplated dostoevsky of course reprimands karamazov and thanks to the standards of modern criticism such a reprimand is accounted sufficient to exonerate our author but there are other standards if a writer sets out to tell you that no drab could be so loathsome that her ugliness would make you forget she was a woman and if for illustration of this novel idea we are told the history of fyodor karamazov with a deformed repulsive idiot stinking lizzie then in face of such imaginative art it is surely out of place to preserve the usual confidence in that writer we do not speak of the interest and appreciation of dostoevsky's tastes and ideas not for one moment will i assert that those who with pushkin and lermontov can see the eternal female only in young and charming women have any advantage over dostoevsky of course we are not forbidden to live according to our tastes and we may like tolstoy call certain women beasts but who has given us the right to assert that we are higher or better than dostoevsky judging objectively all the points go to show that dostoevsky is better at any rate he saw further deeper he could find an original interest he could discover das ewig weibliche where we should see nothing of attraction at all where goethe would avert his face stinking lizzie is not a beast as levine would say but a woman who is able if even for a moment to arouse a feeling of love in a man and we thought she was worse than nothing since she roused in us only disgust dostoevsky made a discovery we with our refined feelings missed it his distorted abnormal sense showed a greater sensitiveness in which our high morality was deficient and the road to the great truth this time as ever is through deformity idealists will not agree they are quite justly afraid that one may not reach the truth but may get stuck in the mud idealists are careful men and not nearly so stupid as their ideals would lead us to suppose eight new ideas even our own do not quickly conquer our sympathies we must first get accustomed to them nine a point of view every writer thinker even every educated person thinks it necessary to have a permanent point of view he climbs up some elevation and never climbs down again all his days whatever he sees from this point of view he believes to be reality truth justice good and what he does not see he excludes from existence man is not much to blame for this surely there is no very great joy in moving from point of view to point of view shifting one's camp from peak to peak we have no wings and a winged thought is only a nice metaphor unless of course it refers to logical thinking there to be sure great volatility is usual a lightness which comes from perfect naivete if not ignorance he who really wishes to know something and not merely to have a philosophy does not rely on logic and is not allured by reason he must clamber from summit to summit and if necessary hibernate in the dales for a wide horizon leads to illusions and in order to familiarize oneself with any object it is essential to go close up to it touch it feel it examine it from top to bottom and on every side one must be ready should this be impossible otherwise to sacrifice the customary position of the body to wriggle to lie flat to stand on one's head in a word to assume the most unnatural of attitudes can there be any question of a permanent point of view 
the more mobility and elasticity a man has the less he values the ordinary equilibrium of his body the oftener he changes his outlook the more he will take in if on the other hand he imagines that from this or the other pinnacle he has the most comfortable survey of the world and life leave him alone he will never know anything nay he does not want to know he cares more about his personal convenience than about the quality of his work no doubt he will attain to fame and success and thus brilliantly justify his point of view end of part two section nine part two sections ten through fourteen of all things are possible by lev shestov ten fame a thread from every one and the naked will have a shirt there is no beggar but has his thread of cotton and he will not grudge it to a naked man no nor even to a fully dressed one but will bestow it on the first comer the poor who want to forget their poverty are very ready with their threads moreover they prefer to give them to the rich rather than to a fellow tramp to load the rich with benefits must not one be very rich indeed that is why fame is so easily got an ambitious person asks admiration and respect from the crowd and is rarely denied the mob feel that their throats are their own and their arms are strong why not vociferate and clap seeing that you can turn the head not only of a beggar like yourself but of a future hero god knows how almighty a person the humiliated citizen who has hitherto been hauled off to the police station if he shouted suddenly feels that his throat has acquired a new value never before has any one given a rap for his worthless opinion and now seven cities are ready to quarrel for it as for the right to claim homer the citizen is delighted he shouts at the top of his voice and is ready to throw all his possessions after his shouts so the hero is satisfied the greater the shout the deeper his belief in himself and his mission what will a hero not believe for he forgets so soon the elements of which his fame and riches are made heroes usually are convinced that they set out on their noble career not to beg shouts from beggars but to heap blessings on mankind if they could only call to mind with what beating hearts they awaited their first applause their first alms how timidly they curried favour with ragged beggars perhaps they would speak less assuredly of their own merits but our memory is fully acquainted with herbert spencer and his law of adaptability and thus many a worthy man goes gaily on in full belief in his own stupendous virtue eleven in defence of righteousness inexperienced and ingenuous people see in righteousness merely a burden which lofty people have assumed out of respect for law or for some other high and inexplicable reason but a righteous man has not only duties but rights true sometimes when the law is against him he has to compromise yet how rarely does the law desert him no cruelty matters in him so long as he does not infringe the statutes nay he will ascribe his cruelty as a merit to himself since he acts out of no personal considerations but in the name of sacred justice no matter what he may do once he is sanctioned he sees in his actions only merit 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 modesty forbids him to say too much but if he were to let go what a luxurious panegyric he might deliver to himself remembering his works he praises himself at all times not aloud but inwardly the nature of virtue demands it man must rejoice in his morality and ever keep it in mind and after that people declare that it is hard to be righteous whatever the other virtues may be certainly righteousness has its selfish side as a rule it is decidedly worth while to make considerable sacrifices in order later on to enjoy in calm confidence all that surety and those rights bestowed on a man by morality and public approval look at a german who has paid his contribution to a society for the assistance of the indigent not one stray farthing will he give not to a poor wretch who is starving before his eyes and in this he feels right this is righteousness out and out pay your tax and enjoy the privileges of a high principled man so righteousness is much in vogue with cultured commercial nations russians have not quite got there 
they are afraid of the exactions of righteousness not guessing the enormous advantages derived a russian has a permanent relationship with his conscience which costs him far more than the most moral german or even englishman has to pay for his righteousness twelve the best way of getting rid of tedious played-out truths is to stop paying them the tribute of respect and to treat them with a touch of easy familiarity and derision to put into brackets as dostoevsky did such words as good self-sacrifice progress and so on will alone achieve you much more than many brilliant arguments would do whilst you still contest a certain truth you still believe in it and this even the least penetrating individual will perceive but if you favour it with no serious attention and only throw out a scornful remark now and then the result is different it is evident you have ceased to be afraid of the old truth you no longer respect it and this sets people thinking thirteen four walls armchair philosophy is being condemned rightly an armchair thinker is busy deciding on everything that is taking place in the world the state of the world market the existence of a world soul wireless telegraphy and the life after death the cave dweller and the perfectibility of man and so on and so on his chief business is so to select his statements that there shall be no internal contradiction and this will give an appearance of truth such work which is quite amusing and even interesting leads at last to very poor results surely verisimilitudes of truth are not truth nor have necessarily anything in common with truth again a man who undertakes to talk of everything probably knows nothing thus a swan can fly and walk and swim but it flies indifferently walks badly and swims poorly an armchair philosopher enclosed by four walls sees nothing but those four walls and yet of these precisely he does not choose to speak if by accident he suddenly realized them and spoke of them his philosophy might acquire an enormous value this may happen when a study is converted into a prison the same four walls but impossible not to think of them whatever the prisoner turns his mind to homer the greek persian wars the future world peace the bygone geological cataclysms still the four walls enclose it all the calm of the study supplanted by the pathos of imprisonment the prisoner has no more contact with the world and no less but now he no longer slumbers and has greyish dreams called world conceptions he is wide awake and strenuously living his philosophy is worth hearing but man is not distinguished for his powers of discrimination he sees solitude in four walls and says a study he dreams of the marketplace where there is noise and jostling physical bustle and decides that there alone life is to be met he is wrong as usual in the marketplace among the crowd do not men sleep their deadest sleep and is not the keenest spiritual activity taking place in seclusion fourteen the spartans made their helots drunk as an example and warning to their noble youths a good method no doubt but what are we of the twentieth century to do whom shall we make drunk we have no slaves so we have instituted a higher literature novels and stories describe drunken dissolute men and paint them in such horrid colours that every reader feels all his desire for vice depart from him unfortunately only our russians are either too conscientious or not sufficiently rectilinear in their minds instead of showing the drunken helot as an object of repugnance as the spartans did they try to describe vice truthfully realism has taken hold indeed why make a fuss what does it matter if the writer's description is a little more or less ugly than the event was justice invented that everything even evil should be kept intact surely evil must be simply rooted out banned placed outside the pale the spartans did not stand on ceremony with living men and yet our novelists are afraid of being unjust to imaginary drunken helots and so to speak out of humane feeling too how naive one must be to accept such a justification yet everybody accepts it tolstoy alone towards the end guessed that humanitarianism is only a pretext in this case and that we russians have described vice not only for the purpose of scaring our readers 
in modern masters the word vice arouses not disgust but insatiable curiosity perhaps the wicked thing has been persecuted in vain like so many other good things perhaps it should have been studied perhaps it held mysteries on the strength of this perhaps morality was gradually abandoned and tolstoy remained almost alone in his indignation realism reigns and a drunken helot arouses envy in timid readers who do not know where to put their trust whether in the traditional rules or in the appeal of the master a drunken helot an ideal what have we come to were it not better to have stuck to lycurgus have we not paid too dearly for our progress many people think we have paid too dearly not to mention tolstoy who is now no longer taken quite seriously though still accounted a great man any mediocre journalist enjoys greater influence than this master writer of the russian land it is inevitable tolstoy insists on thinking about things which are nobody's concern he has long since abandoned this world and does he continue to exist in any other a difficult question tolstoy writes books and letters therefore he exists this inference once so convincing now has hardly any effect on us particularly if we take into account what it is that tolstoy writes in several of his last letters he expresses opinions which surely have no meaning for an ordinary man they can be summed up in a few words tolstoy professes an extreme egoism solipsism so loose ipsism that is in his old age after infinite attempts to love his neighbour he comes to the conclusion that not only is it impossible to love one's neighbour but that there is no neighbour that in all the world tolstoy alone exists that there is even no world but only tolstoy a view so obviously absurd that it is not worth refuting by the way there is also no possibility of refuting it unless you admit that logical inferences are non-binding solipsism dogged tolstoy already in early youth but at that time he did not know what to do with the impertinent oppressive idea so he ignored it finally he came to it the older a man becomes the more he learns how to make use of impertinent ideas fairly recently tolstoy could pronounce such a dictum christ taught men not to do stupid things who but tolstoy could have ventured on such an interpretation of the gospels why have we all held all of us but tolstoy that these words contain the greatest blasphemy on christ and his teaching but it was tolstoy's last desperate attempt to save himself from solipsism without at the same time flying in the face of logic even christ appeared among men only to teach them common sense whence follows that mad thoughts may be rejected with an easy conscience and the advantage as usual remains with the wholesome reasonable sensible thoughts there is room for good and for reason good is self-understood and need not be explained if only good existed in the world there would exist no questions neither simple nor ultimate this is why youth never questions what indeed should it question the song of the nightingale the morning of may happy laughter all the predicates of youth do these need interpretation on the contrary any explanation is reduced to these the proper questions arise only on contact with evil a hawk struck a nightingale flowers withered boreas froze laughing youth and in terror our questions arose that is evil the ancients were right not in vain is our earth called a veil of tears and sorrow and once questions are started it is impossible and unseemly to hurry the answers still less anticipate the questions the nightingale is dead and will sing no longer the listener is frozen to death and can hear no more songs the situation is so palpably absurd that only with the intention of getting rid of the question at any cost will one strive for a sensible answer the answer must be absurd if you don't want it don't question but if you must question then be ready beforehand to reconcile yourself with something like solipsism or modern realism thought is in a dilemma and dare not take the leap to get out we laugh at philosophy and as long as possible avoid evil but nearly all men feel the intolerable cramp of such a situation and each at his risk ventures to swim to shore on some more or less witty theory a few courageous ones speak the truth but they are neither understood nor respected 
when a man's words show the depth of the pain through which he has passed he is not indeed condemned but the world begins to talk of his tragic state of soul and to take on a mournful look fitting to the occasion others more scrupulous feel that phrases and mournful looks are unfitting yet they cannot dwell at length on the tragedies of outsiders so they take on an exaggeratedly stern bearing as if to say we feel deeply but we do not wish to show our feeling they really feel nothing only want to make others believe how sensitive and modest they are at times this leads to curious results even in writers of the first order of renown thus anatole france the inventor of that most charming smile which is intended to convince men that he feels everything and understands everything but does not cry out because that would not be fitting in one of his novels takes upon himself the noble role of advocate of the victims of a crime against the criminal our time he says out of pity to the criminal forgets the sufferings of his victim this i repeat is one of the most curious misrepresentations of modern endeavour it is true we in russia talk a good deal about compassion particularly to criminals and anatole france is by no means the only man who thinks that our distinguishing characteristic is extreme sensitiveness and tender-heartedness but as a matter of fact the modern man who thinks for himself is not drawn to the criminal by a sense of compassion which would incontestably be better applied to the victim but by curiosity or if you like inquisitiveness for thousands of years man has sought to solve the great mystery of life through a god conception with theodicy and metaphysical theories as a result both of which deny the possibility of a mystery theodicy has long ago wearied us the mechanistic theories which contend that there is nothing special in life that its appearance and disappearance depend on the same laws as those of the conservation of energy and the indestructibility of matter these look more plausible at first sight but people do not take to them and no theory can survive men's reluctance to believe in it in a word good has not justified the expectations placed on it reason has done no better so overwrought mankind has turned from its old idols and enthroned madness and evil the smiling anatole argues and proves proves excellently but who does not know what his proofs amount to and who wants them it may be our children will take fright at the task we have undertaken will call us squandering parents and will set themselves again to heaping up treasures spiritual and material again they will believe in ideals progress and such like for my own part i have hardly any doubt of it solipsism and the cult of groundlessness are not lasting and most of all they are not to be handed down the final triumph in life as in old comedies rests with goodness and common sense history has known many epochs like ours and gone through with them degeneration follows on the heels of immoderate curiosity and sweeps away all refined and exaggeratedly well-informed individuals men of genius have no posterity or their children are idiots not for nothing is nature so majestically serene she has hidden her secrets well enough which is not surprising considering how unscrupulous she is no despot not the greatest villain on earth has ever wielded power with the cruelty and heartlessness of nature the least violation of her laws and the severest punishment follows disease deformity madness death what has not our common mother contrived to keep us in subjection true certain optimists think that nature does not punish us but educates us so tolstoy sees it death and sufferings like animated scarecrows boo at man and drive him into the one way of life open to him for life is subject to its own law of reason not a bad method of upbringing exactly like using wolves and bears unfortunate man bolting from one booing monster is not always able in time to dodge into the one correct way and dashes straight into the maw of another beast of prey then what and this often happens without disparagement of the optimists we may say that sooner or later it happens to every man after which no more running you won't tear yourself out of the claws of madness or disease only one thing is left in spite of traditions theodicy wiseacres and most of all in spite of oneself to go on praising mother nature and her great goodness 
let future generations reject us let history stigmatize our names as the name of traitors to the human cause still we will compose hymns to deformity destruction madness chaos darkness and after that let the grass grow end of part two section fourteen part two sections fifteen to twenty three of all things are possible by lev shestov section fifteen astrology and alchemy lived their day and died a natural death but they left a posterity chemistry inventing dyes and astronomy accumulating formulae so it is geniuses beget idiots especially when the mothers are very virtuous as in this case when their virtue is extraordinary for the mothers are public utility and morality the alchemists wasted their time seeking the philosopher's stone the astrologers swindled people telling fortunes by the stars wedded to utility these two fathers have begotten the chemists and astronomers nobody will dispute the genealogy perhaps even none will dispute that from idiotic children one may with a measure of probability infer genius in the parents there are certain indications that this is so though of course one may not go beyond supposition but supposition is enough there are more arguments in store for instance our day is so convinced of the absolute nonsense and uselessness of alchemy and astrology that no one dreams of verifying the conviction we know there were many charlatans and liars amongst alchemists and astrologers but what does this prove in every department there are the same mediocre creatures who speculate on human credulity however positive our science of medicine is there are many fraudulent doctors who rob their patients the alchemists and astrologers were in all probability the most remarkable men of their time i will go further in spite of dye stuffs and formulae even in our nineteenth century which was so famous for its inventions and discoveries the most eminent talented men still sought the philosopher's stone and forecast the destinies of man and those among them who were possessed of a poetic gift won universal attention in the old days consensu sapientium a poet was allowed all kinds of liberties he might speak of fate miracles spirits the life beyond indeed of anything provided he was interesting that was enough the nineteenth century paid its tribute to restlessness never were there so many disturbing throbbing writers as during the epoch of telephones and telegraphs it was held indecent to speak in plain language of the vexed and troubled aspirations of the human spirit those guilty of the indecency were even dosed with bromides and treated with shower baths and concentrated foods but all this is external it belongs to a history of fashions and cannot interest us here the point is that alchemy and astrology did not die they only shammed death and left the stage for a time now apparently they are tired of seclusion and are coming forward again having pushed their unsuccessful children into the background well so be it a la bonne heure sixteen man comes to the pass where all experience seems exhausted wherever he go whatever he see all is old and wearyingly familiar most people explain this by saying that they really know everything and that from what they have experienced they can infer all experience this phase of the exhaustion of life usually comes to a man between thirty-five and forty the best period according to karamzin not seeing anything new the individual assumes he is completely matured and has the right to judge of everything knowing what has been he can forecast what will be but karamzin was mistaken about the best period and the mature people are mistaken about the nothing new can happen the fact of spiritual stagnation should not be made the ground for judging all life's possibilities from known possibilities on the contrary such stagnation should prove that however rich and multifarious the past may have been it has not exhausted a tittle of the whole possibilities from that which has been it is impossible to infer what will be moreover it is unnecessary 
except perhaps to give us a sense of our full maturity and let us enjoy all the charms of the best period of life so eloquently described by karamzin the temptation is not overwhelming so that if man is under the necessity of enduring a period of arrest and stagnation and until such time as life restarts is doomed to meditation would it not be better to use this meditating interregnum for a directly opposite purpose from the one indicated that is to say for the purpose of finding in our past signs which tell us that the future has every right to be anything whatsoever like or utterly unlike the past such signs given a good will to find them may be seen in plenty at times one comes to the conclusion that the natural connection of phenomena as hitherto observed is not at all inevitable for the future and that miracles which so far have seemed impossible may come to seem possible even natural far more natural than that loathsome law of sequence the law of the regularity of phenomena we are bored stiff with regularity and sequence confess it you also you men of science at the mere thought that however we may think we can get no further than the acknowledgment of the old regularity an invincible disgust to any kind of mental work overcomes us to discover another law still another when already we have far more than we can do with surely if there is any will to think left in us it is established in the supposition that the mind cannot and must not have any bounds any limits and that the theory of knowledge which is based on the history of knowledge and on a few very doubtful assumptions is only a piece of property belonging to a certain caste and has nothing to do with us others und die natur zu sich doch ergründe what a mad impatience seizes us at times when we realize that we shall never fathom the great mystery every individual in the world must have felt at one time the mad desire to unriddle the universe even the stodgy philosophers who invented the theory of knowledge have at times made surreptitious sorties hoping to open a path to the unknown in spite of their own fat senseless books that demonstrate the advantages of scientific knowledge man either lives in continuous experience or he frees himself from conclusions imposed by limited experience all the rest is the devil from the devil come the blandishments with which karamzin charmed himself and his readers or is it the contrary who will answer once again as usual at the end of a pathetic speech one is left with a conjecture let every man please himself but what about those who would like to live according to karamzin but cannot i cannot speak for them schiller recommended hope will it do to be frank hardly he who has once lost his peace of mind will never find it again seventeen ever since kant succeeded in convincing the learned that the world of phenomena is quite other than the world of true reality and that even our own existence is not our real existence but only the visible manifestation of a mysterious unknown substance philosophy has been stuck in a new rut and cannot move a single millimetre out of the track laid out by the great Königsbergian. backward or forward it can go but necessarily in the kantian rut for how can you get out of the counterposing of the phenomenon against the thing in itself this proposition this counterposing seems inalterable so there is nothing left but to stick your head in the heavy draught collar of the theory of knowledge which most philosophers do even with a glad smile which inevitably rouses a suspicion that they have got what they wanted and their metaphysical need was nothing more than a need for a harness otherwise they would have kicked at the sight of the collar surely the contraposition between the world of phenomena and the thing in itself is an invention of the reasoning mind as is the theory of knowledge deduced from this contraposing therefore the freedom-loving spirit could reject it in the very beginning and basta with the devil one must be very cautious we know quite well that if he only gets hold of the tip of your ear he will carry off your whole body so it is with reason grant it one single assumption admit but one proposition and finita la commedia you are in the toils metaphysics cannot exist side by side with reason everything metaphysical is absurd 
everything reasonable is positive so we come upon a dilemma the fundamental predicate of metaphysics is absurdity and yet surely many positive assertions can lay legitimate claim to that self-same highly respectable predicate what then is there means of distinguishing a metaphysical absurdity from a perfectly ordinary one may one have recourse to criteria will not the very criterion prove a pitfall wherein cunning reason will catch the poor man who was rushing out to freedom there can be no two answers to this question all services rendered by reason must be paid for sooner or later at the exorbitant price of self-renunciation whether you accept the assistance in the noble form of the theory of knowledge or merely as a humble criterion at last you will be driven forth into the streets of positivism this happens all the time to young inexperienced minds they break the bridle and dash forward into space to find themselves rushing into the same old rome whither as we know all roads lead or to use more lofty language rushing into the stable whither also all roads lead the only way to guard against positivism granting of course that positivism no longer attracts your sympathies is to cease to fear any absurdities whether rational or metaphysical and systematically to reject all the services of reason such behavior has been known in philosophy and i make bold to recommend it credo quia absurdum comes from the middle ages modern instances are nietzsche and schopenhauer both present noble examples of indifference to logic and common sense particularly schopenhauer who a kantian even in the name of kant made such daring sallies against reason driving her into confusion and shame that astounding kantian even went so far in the master's name still as to attempt the overthrow of the space and time notions he admitted clairvoyance and to this day the learned are bothered whether to class that admission among the metaphysical or the ordinary absurdities really i can't advise them a very clever man insists on an enormous absurdity so i am satisfied schopenhauer's whole campaign against intellect is very comforting it is evident that though he set out from the kantian stable he soon got sick of hauling along down the cart ruts and having broken the shafts he trotted jauntily into a jungle of irreconcilable contradictions without reflecting in the least where he was making for the primate of will over reason and music as the expression of our deepest essence are not these assertions sufficient to show us how dexterously he wriggled out from the harness of synthetic judgments a priori which kant had placed upon every thinker there is indeed much more music than logic in the philosophy of schopenhauer not for nothing is he excluded from the universities but of course one may speak of him in the open not of his ideas naturally but of his music the european market is glutted with ideas how neat and nicely finished and logically well turned out those ideas are schopenhauer had no such goods but what lively and splendid contradictions he boldly spreads on his stall often even without suspicion that he ought to hide them from the police schopenhauer cries and laughs and gets furious or glad without ever realizing that this is forbidden to a philosopher do not speak but sing said zarathustra and schopenhauer really fulfilled the command in great measure philosophy may be music though it doesn't follow that music may be called philosophy when a man has done his work and gives himself up to looking and listening and pleasantly accepting everything hiding nothing from himself then he begins to philosophize what good are abstract formulae to him why should he ask himself before he begins to think what can i think about what are the limits of thought he will think and those who like can do the summing up and the building of theories of knowledge what is the earthly use of talking about beauty beautiful things must be created not one single aesthetic theory has so far been able to guess what direction the artist's mind will next take or what are the limits to his creative activity the same with the theory of knowledge it may arrest the work of a man of learning if he be himself afraid that he is going too far but it is powerless to predetermine human thought 
even kant's counterposing of things in themselves to the world of phenomena cannot finally clip the wings of human curiosity there will come a time when this unshakable foundation of positivism will be shaken all noseological disputes as to what thought can or cannot achieve will seem to our posterity just as amusing as the disputes of the schoolmen seem to us why do they argue about the nature of truth when they might have gone out and looked for truth itself the future historians will ask let us have an answer ready for them our contemporaries do not want to go out and seek so they make a great deal of talk about a theory of knowledge eighteen trust not thyself young dreamer however sincerely you may long for truth whatever sufferings and horrors you may have surpassed do not believe your own self young dreamer what you are looking for you won't find at the utmost if you have a gift for writing you will bring out a nice original book even do not be offended you may be satisfied with such a result in nietzsche's letters relating to the year eighteen eighty eight the year when brandes discovered him you will find a sad confirmation of the above had not nietzsche struggled sought suffered and behold towards the end of his life when it would have seemed that all mundane rewards had become trivial to him he threw himself with rapture on the tidings of first fame and rushed to share his joy with all his friends far and near he does not tire of telling in dozens of letters and in varying forms the story of how brandes first began his lectures on him nietzsche how the audience consisted of three hundred people and he even quotes brandes's placard announcement in the original danish fame just threw him a smile and forgotten are all the horrible experiences of former days the loneliness the desertedness the cave in the mountain the man into whose mouth the serpent climbed all forgotten every thought turned to the ordinary easily comprehensible good such is man mit gierger hand nach schätzen grip und froh ist wenn er regen wurmer findet nineteen when a man is young he writes because it seems to him he has discovered a new almighty truth which he must make haste to impart to forlorn mankind later becoming more modest he begins to doubt his truths and then he writes to convince himself a few more years go by and he knows he was mistaken all round so there is no need to convince himself nevertheless he continues to write because he is not fit for any other work and to be accounted a superfluous man is so horrible twenty a very original man is often a banal writer and vice versa we tend so often to write not about what is going on in us but of our pia desideria thus restless sleepless men sing the glory of sleep and rest which have long been sung to death and those who sleep ten hours on end and are always up to the mark must perforce dream about adventures and storms and dangers and even extol everything problematical twenty one when one reads the books of long dead men a strange sensation comes over one these men who lived two hundred three hundred three thousand years ago are so far off now from this writing which they have left on earth yet we look for eternal truths in their works twenty two the truth which i have the right to announce so solemnly to-day even to the first among men will probably be a stale old lie on my lips to-morrow so i will deprive myself of the right of calling such a truth my own probably i shall deprive no one but myself others will go on loving and praising the self-same truth living with it twenty three a writer who cannot lie with inspiration and that is a great art which few may accomplish loves to make an exhibition of honesty and frankness nothing else is left him to do end of part two section twenty three part two sections twenty four to thirty two of all things are possible by lev shestov section twenty four the source of originality a man who has lost all hope of rooting out of himself a certain radical defect of character or even of hiding the flaw from others turns round and tries to find in his defect a certain merit 
if he succeeds in convincing his acquaintances he achieves a double gain first he quiets his conscience and then he acquires a reputation for being original twenty five men begin to strive towards great ends when they feel they cannot cope with the little tasks of life they often have their measure of success twenty six a belch interrupts the loftiest meditation you may draw a conclusion if you like if you don't like you needn't twenty seven a woman of conviction we forgive a man his convictions however unwillingly it goes without saying that we balk at any individual who believes in his own infallibility but one must reconcile oneself with necessity it is ugly and preposterous to have corns on one's hands but still they can't be avoided in this unparadisal earth of sweat and labor but why see an ideal in callosities in practical life particularly in the social political life to which we are doomed convictions are a necessity unity is strength and unity is possible only among people who think alike again a deep conviction is in itself a strong force far more powerful than the most logical argumentation sometimes one has only to pronounce in a full round vibrating chest voice such as is peculiar to people of conviction some trifling sentence and an audience hitherto unconvinced is carried away truth is often dumb particularly a new truth which is most shy of people and which has a feeble hoarse voice but in certain situations that which will influence the crowd is more important than that which is genuine truth convictions are necessary to a public man but he who is too clever to believe in himself entirely and is not enough of an actor to look as if he believed he had best give up public work altogether at the same time he will realize that lack of convictions is not profitable and will look with more indulgence on such as are bound to keep themselves well supplied yet all the more will he dislike those men who without any necessity disfigure themselves with the coarse tattoo marks and particularly he will object to such women what can be more intolerable than a woman of conviction she lives in a family without having to grind for her daily bread why disfigure herself why wilfully rub her hands into corns when she might keep them clean and pretty women moreover usually pick up their convictions ready-made from the man who interests them most at the moment and never do they do this so vigorously as when the man himself seems incapable of paving the way to his ideas they are full of feeling for him they rush to the last extremities of resource will not their feeble little fists help him it may be touching but in the end it is intolerable so it is much pleasanter to meet a woman who believes in her husband and does not consider it necessary to help him she can then dispense with convictions twenty eight emancipation of women the one and only way of mastering an enemy is to learn the use of his weapons starting from this modern woman weary of being the slave of man tries to learn all his tricks hard is slavery wonderful is freedom slavery at last is so unendurable that a human being will sacrifice everything for freedom of what use are his virtues to a prisoner languishing in prison he has one aim one object to get out of prison and he values only such qualities in himself as will assist his escape if it is necessary to break an iron grating by physical force then strong muscles will seem to the prisoner the most desirable of all things if cunning will help him cunning is the finest thing on earth something the same happens with woman she became convinced that man owed his priority chiefly to education and a trained mind so she threw herself on books and universities learning that promises freedom is light everything else darkness of course it is a delusion but you could never convince her of it for that would mean the collapse of her best hopes of freedom but in the end woman will be as well informed as man she will furnish herself with broad views and unshakable convictions with a philosophy also and in the end she may even learn to think logically then probably the many misunderstandings between the sexes will cease but heavens how tedious it will be men will argue women will argue children will probably be born fully instructed understanding everything 
with what pain will the men of the future view our women capricious frivolous uninformed creatures understanding nothing and desiring to understand nothing a whole half of the human race neither would nor could have any understanding but the hope lies there maybe we can do without understanding perhaps a logical mind is not an attribute but a curse in the struggle for existence however and the survival of the fittest not a few of the best human qualities have perished obviously woman's illogicality is also destined to disappear it is a thousand pities twenty nine all kinds of literature are good except the tedious said voltaire we may enlarge the idea all men and all activities are good except the tedious whatever your failings and your vices if you are only amusing or interesting all is forgiven you accordingly frankness and naturalness are quite rightly considered doubtful virtues if people say that frankness and naturalness are virtues always take it cum grano solis sometimes it is permissible and even opportune to fire off truth of all sorts sometimes one may stretch oneself like a log across the road but god forbid that such sincere practices should be raised into a principle to out with the truth at all times always to reveal oneself entirely besides being impossible to accomplish never having been accomplished even in the confessions of the greatest men is moreover a far more risky business than it seems i can confidently assert that if any man tried to tell the whole truth about himself not metaphorically for every metaphor is a covering ornament but in plain bare words that man would ruin himself forever for he would lose all interest in the eyes of his neighbours and even in his own eyes each of us bears in his soul a heavy wound and knows it yet carries himself must carry himself as if he were aware of nothing while all around keep up the pretence remember lermontov look around you playfully the crowd moves on the usual road scarce a mark of trouble on the festive faces not one indecent tear and yet is barely one amongst them but is crushed by heavy torture or has gathered the wrinkles of young age save from crime or loss these words are horribly true and the really horrible should be concealed it frightens one off i admit byron and lermontov could make it alluring but all that is alluring depends on vagueness remoteness any monster may be beautiful in the distance and no man can be interesting unless he keep a certain distance between himself and people women do not understand this if they like a man they try to come utterly near to him and are surprised that he does not meet their frankness with frankness and admit them to his holy of holies but in the innermost sanctuary the only beauty is inaccessibility as a rule it is not a sanctuary but a lair where the wounded beast in man has run to lick his wounds and shall this be done in public people generally and women particularly ought to be given something positive in books one may still sing the praise of wounds hopelessness and despair whatever you like for books are still literature a conventionality but to strip one's anguish in the open market to confess an incurable disease to others this is to kill one's soul not to relieve it all even the best men have some aversion for you perhaps in the interest of order and decorum they will grant you a not too important place in their philosophy of life for in a philosophy of life as in a cemetery a place is prepared for each and all and every one is welcome there also are enclosures where rubbish is dumped to rot but for those who have as yet no desire to be fitted into a world philosophy i would advise them to keep their tongue between their teeth or like nietzsche and dostoevsky take to literature to a writer in books and only in books all is permitted provided he has talent but in actual living even a writer must not let loose too much lest people should guess that in his books he is telling the truth thirty pushkin asserts that the poet himself can and must be the judge of his own work are you content exacting artist content then let the mob revile it is needless to argue against this for how could you prove that the supreme verdict belongs not to the poet himself but to public opinion nor for that matter can we prove pushkin right we must agree or disagree as we like but we cannot reject the evidence whether you like it or not pushkin was evidently satisfied with his own work 
and did not need his reader's sanction happy man and it seems to me he owed his happiness exclusively to his inability to pass beyond certain limits i doubt if all poets would agree to repeat pushkin's verse quoted above i decidedly refuse to believe that shakespeare for instance after finishing hamlet or king lear could have said to himself i who judge my work more strictly than any other can judge am satisfied i do not think he can even have thought for a moment of the merits of his works hamlet or king lear to shakespeare after hamlet the word satisfied must have lost all its meaning and if he used it it was only by force of habit as we sometimes call to a dead person his own works must have seemed to him imperfect mean pitiful like the sob of a child or the moaning of a sick man he gave them to the theatre and most probably was surprised that they had any success perhaps he was glad that his tears were of some use if only for amusing and instructing people and probably in this sense the verdict of the crowd was dearer to him than his own verdict he could not help accusing his own offspring thank heaven other people acquitted it true they acquitted it because they did not understand or understood imperfectly but this did not matter use every man after his desert and who should scape a whipping asked hamlet shakespeare knew that a strict tribunal would reject his works for they contained so many terrible questions and not one perfect answer could any one be satisfied at that rate perhaps with comedy of errors twelfth night or even richard the third but after hamlet a man may find rest only in his grave to speak the whole truth i doubt if pushkin himself maintained the view we have quoted till the end of his days or even if he spoke all he felt when he wrote the poem in eighteen thirty possibly he felt how little a poet can be satisfied with his work but pride prevented his admitting it and he tried to console himself with his superiority over the crowd which is undeniably a right thing to do insults and pushkin had to endure many are answered with contempt and woe to the poor wretch who feels impelled to justify his contempt by his own merits according to the strict voice of conscience such niceness is dangerous and unnecessary if a man would preserve his strength and his confidence he must give up magnanimity he must learn to despise people and even if he cannot despise them he must have the air of one who would not give a pin's head for anybody he must appear always content pushkin was a clever man and a deep nature thirty one metaphysics against their will it often occurs to us that evil is not altogether so unnecessary after all diseases humiliations miseries deformity failure and all the rest of those plants which flourish with such truly tropical luxuriance on our planet are probably essential to man poets sing plentifully of sorrow nous sommes les apprentis la douleur et notre maître said de musset on this subject everybody can bring forth a quotation not only from the philosophers who are a cold heartless tribe but from tender gentle or sentimental poets doubtless one knows many instances where suffering has profited a man true also one knows many cases of the direct opposite and these are all cases of profound earnest outrageous incredibly outrageous suffering look at chekhov's men and women plainly drawn from life or at any rate exceedingly lifelike uncle vanya an old man of fifty cries beside himself all over the stage my life is done for my life is done for and senselessly shoots at a harmless professor the hero in a tedious story was a quiet happy man engaged in work of real importance when suddenly a horrible disease stole upon him not killing him but taking him between its loathsome jaws but what for then chekhov's girls and women they are mostly young innocent fascinating and always there lies in wait for them round every corner a meaningless rude ugly misery which murders even the most modest hopes they sob bitterly but fate takes no notice how explain such horrors chekhov is silent he does not weep himself he left off long ago and besides it is a humiliating thing for a grown-up person to do setting one's teeth it is necessary either to keep silent or to explain well metaphysics undertakes the explanation where common sense stops metaphysics must take another stride we have seen it says many instances where at first glance suffering seemed absurd and needless 
but where later on a profound significance was revealed thus it may be that what we cannot explain may find its explanation in time life is lost cries uncle vanya life is done for repeat the voices of girls innocently perishing yet nothing is lost the very horror which a drowning man experiences goes to show that the drowning is nothing final it is only the beginning of greater events the less a man has fulfilled an experience the more in him remains of unsatisfied passion and desire the greater are the grounds for thinking that his essence cannot be destroyed but must manifest itself somehow or other in the universe voluntary asceticism and self-denial such common human phenomena help to solve the riddle nobody compels a man he imposes suffering and abstinence on himself it is an incomprehensible instinct but still an instinct which rooted in the depths of our nature prompts us to a decision repugnant to reason renounce life save yourself the majority of men do not hear or do not heed the prompting and then nature which cannot rely on our sensibility has recourse to violence she shows glimpses of paradise to us in our youth awakens hopes and impossible desires and at the moment of our supreme expectation she shows us the hollowness of our hope nearly every life can be summed up in a few words man was shown heaven and thrown into the mud we are all ascetics voluntary or involuntary here on earth dreams and hopes are only awakened not fulfilled and he who has endured most suffering most privation will awaken in the afterwards most keenly alive such long speeches metaphysics whispers to us and we repeat them often leaving out the it may be sometimes we believe them and forge our philosophies from them even we go so far as to assert that had we the power we would change nothing absolutely nothing in the world and yet if by some miracle such power came into our hands how triumphantly we would send to the devil all philosophies and lofty world conceptions all ideals and metaphysics and plainly and simply without reflection abolish sufferings deformities failures all those things to which we attach such a high educational value abolish them from the face of the earth we are fed up oh how fed up we are with carrying on our studies but it can't be helped faute de mieux let us keep on inventing systems thinking them out but let us agree not to be cross with those who don't want to have anything to do with our systems really they have a perfect right thirty two old age must be respected so all say even the old and the young willingly meet the demand but in such spontaneous even often emphatic respect is there not something insulting to old age every young man by his voluntary deference seems to say and still the rising star shines brighter than the setting and the old accepting the respect are well aware that they can count on nothing more the young are attentive and respectful to the old only upon the express condition that the latter shall behave like old people and stand aside from life let a real man try to follow faust's example and what a shindy there will be the old being as a rule helpless are compelled to bow to public opinion and behave as if their only interests were the interests of righteousness good name and such like platonic attributes only a few go against the convention and these are monsters and degenerates we do not wish old men to have desires so that life is arranged as if old men desired nothing this of course is no great matter even the young are compelled to be satisfied with less than nothing in our system we are not out to meddle with human rights our point is that science and philosophy take enforced appearances for reality grey hair is supposed to be a sure sign of victory over the passions hence seeing that we must all come to grey hairs therefore the ultimate business of man is to overcome the passions on this granite foundation whole systems of philosophy are built it is not worth while quarrelling with a custom let us continue to pay respect to old age but let us look in other directions for philosophic bases it is time to open a free road to the passions even in the province of metaphysics end of part two section thirty two part two sections thirty three to forty of all things are possible by lev shestov section thirty three 
dostoevsky advocatus diaboli dostoevsky like nietzsche disliked protestantism and tried every means of degrading it in the eyes of the world as normally he was not over scrupulous it is probable he never took the trouble to acquaint himself with luther's teaching his flair did not deceive him the protestant religion and morality was most unsuitable to him and his kind but does this mean that it was to be calumniated and judged as dostoevsky judged it merely by the etymological meaning of a word protestant a protester one who only protests and has no positive content a child's textbook of history will show the absurdity of the definition protestantism is on the whole the most positive assertive creed of all the christian religions it certainly protested against catholicism but against the destructive tendencies in the latter and in the name of positive ideals catholicism relied too much on its power and its spell and most of all on the infallibility of its dogmas to which it offered millions of victims to maim and mutilate a man ad majorum gloriam dei was considered a perfectly proper thing in the middle ages the period of bloom for catholicism at the risk of appearing paradoxical i venture to assert that ideas have been invented only for the purpose of giving the right to mutilate people the middle ages nourished a mysterious incomprehensible hatred for everything normal self-satisfied complete a young healthy handsome man at peace with himself aroused suspicion and hostility in a believing catholic his very appearance offended religion and confuted dogma it was not necessary to examine him even though he went to church and gave no sign of doubt either in deed or word yet he must be a heretic to be converted at all cost and we know the catholic cost privation asceticism mortification of the flesh the most normal person kept on a monastic regime will lose his spiritual balance and all those virtues which belong to a healthy spirit and a healthy body this was all catholicism needed it tried to obtain from people the extreme endeavor of their whole being ordinary natural love which found its satisfaction this was sinful monks and priests were condemned to celibacy hence monstrous and abnormal passions developed poverty was preached and the most unheard-of greed appeared in the world the more secret the stronger it became humility was essential and out of barefooted monks sprang despots who had no limits to their ambitions luther was the last man to understand the meaning and value of the task which catholicism had set itself what he saw in rome was not the accidental outcome of this or the other historical circumstance but a result of the age-long efforts of generations that had striven to attribute to life as alarming and dangerous a nature as possible the sincere direct rustic german monk was too simple-minded to make out what was going on in rome he thought there existed one truth and that the essence of catholicism lay in what seemed to him an exemplary virtuous life he went direct to his aim what meaning can monasticism have why deprive a priest of family happiness how accept the licentiousness of the pope's capital the common sense of the normal german revolted against the absurdity of such a state of things and luther neither could nor would see any good where common sense was utterly forgotten the violent oscillation of life resulting from the continuous quick passage from asceticism and blind faith to unbelief and freedom of the passions aroused a mystic horror in the honest monk and released the enormous powers in him necessary to start the great struggle how could he help protesting and who was the denier luther or the rome which passed on from the keeping of the divine word to the arbitrary ordaining of all the mysteries of life luther might have forgiven the monks had they confined themselves to sophistries but medieval monks had nothing in common with our philosophers they did not look for world conceptions in books and logical tournaments amused them only moderately they threw themselves into the deeps of life they experimented on themselves and their neighbors they passed from mortification to licentious bacchanalia they feared nothing spared nothing in a word the rome against which luther arose had undertaken to build babylon again not with stones but with human souls luther horrified withdrew and with him half europe was withdrawn that is his positive merit
and dostoevsky attacked lutheranism and pitied the old catholicism and the breathless heights to which its spiritual children had risen wholesome morality and its support is not enough for dostoevsky all this is not positive it is only protest whether i am believed or not i will repeat that vladimir solovyov who held that dostoevsky was a prophet is wrong and that n k mikhailovsky who calls him a cruel talent and a grubber after buried treasure is right dostoevsky grubs after buried treasure no doubt about that and therefore it would be more becoming in the younger generation that still marches under the flag of pious idealism if instead of choosing him as a spiritual leader they avoided the old sorcerer in whom only those gifted with great short-sightedness or lack of experience in life could fail to see the dangerous man thirty four it is boring and difficult to convince people and after all not necessary it would be much better if every individual kept his own opinions unfortunately it cannot be whether you like it or not you have to admit the law of gravitation some people find it necessary to admit the origin of man from the monkey in the empirical realm however humiliating it may be there are certain real binding universal truths against which no rebellion will avail with what pleasure would we declare to a representative of science that fire does not burn the rattlesnakes are not poisonous that a fall from a high tower is perfectly agreeable etc etc supposing he were obliged to prove to us the contrary unluckily the scientific person is free from the burden of proof nature proves and thoroughly if nature like metaphysics set out to compel us through syllogisms or sermons to believe in her how little she would get out of us she is much more sagacious morality and logic she has left to hegel and spinoza for herself she has taken a cudgel now then try to argue against this you will give in against your will the cleverest of all the metaphysicians catholic inquisitors imitated nature they rarely tried the word and trusted to the fire of faggots rather than of the heart had they only had more power it would not be possible to find two people in the whole world disbelieving in the infallibility of the pope metaphysical ideas dreamily expecting to conquer the world by reasoned exposition will never attain dominion if they are bent on success let them try more effective methods of convincing thirty five evolution in recent years we see more and more change in the philosophies of writers and even of non-literary people the old men are beside themselves such shiftiness seems indecent after all convictions are not gloves but the young carelessly pass on from one idea to another irresolute men are somewhat timid and although they abandon their former convictions they do not declare the change openly others however plainly announce as if it were nothing how far they now are from the beliefs they held six months ago one even publishes whole volumes relating how he passed on from one philosophy to another and then to a third people see nothing alarming in that kind of evolution they believe it is in the ordering of things but not so at all the readiness to leave off one set of convictions in order to assume another set shows complete indifference to convictions altogether not for nothing do the old sound the alarm but to us who have fought so long against all kinds of constancy the levity of the young is a pleasant sight they will don materialism positivism kantianism spiritualism and so on one after the other till they realize that all theories ideas and ideals are of as little consequence as the hoop skirts and crinolines of our grandmothers then they will begin to live without ideals and prearranged purposes without foresight relying on chance and their own ready wit this way too must be tried perhaps we shall do better by it anyway it will be more fun thirty six strength of will weakness and paralysis of the will a very dangerous disease in our times and in most other times consists not in the absolute loss of desire such as takes place in the very old but in the loss of the capacity to translate desire into deed a diseased will is often met in violently passionate men so that the proverb say i will not not i cannot does not always hold good man often would but cannot 
and then the force of desire instead of moving to outward creation works inwardly this is justly considered the most dangerous effect of the weakening of the will for inward working is destructive working man does not only to put it scientifically fail to adapt nature to his needs but he loses his own power of adaptability to outward circumstances the most ordinary doctor or even anybody decides that he has before him a pathological case which must be treated with care the patient is of the same opinion whilst he still hopes but when the treatment has had no results the doctor draws back and speaks of the inadequacy of his science then what is the patient to retire upon it is disgusting to speak of an incurable disease so he begins to think 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 all the time about things of which nobody thinks he is gradually forgotten and gradually he forgets everything but first of all that widespread truth which asserts that no judgments are valid save those that are accepted and universal not that he disputes the truth he forgets it and there is none to remind him to him all his judgments seem valid and important of course he cannot advance the principle let all men turn from the external world into themselves but why advance the principle at all one can simply say i am indifferent to the destinies of the external world i do not want to move mountains or turn rivers aside or rearrange the map of europe i don't even want to go to the tobacconist to buy cigarettes i don't want to do anything i want to think that my inaction is the most important thing on earth that any disease is better than health and so on and so on without end to what thoughts will not a man abandoned by medicine and doctors sink down his judgments are not binding on us that is as clear as day but are they uninteresting and is that paralysis that weakness of will a disease only thirty seven death and metaphysics a superficial observer knows that the best things in life are hard to attain some psychologists even consider that the chief beauty of the highest things consists in their unattainability this is surely not true yet there is a grain in it the roads to good things are dangerous to travel is it because nature is so much poorer than we imagine so she must lock up her blessings or is there some greater meaning in it that we have not guessed for the fact is the more alluring an end we have in view the more risks and horrors we must undertake to get there may we not also make a contrary suggestion that behind every danger something good is hidden and that therefore danger serves as an indication a mark to guide us onwards not as a warning as we are taught to believe to decide this would be to decide that behind death the greatest of dangers must lie the most promising things it is as well not to speculate further we had best stop lest we quarrel even with metaphysics traditional metaphysics has always been able to illumine our temporal existence with the reflected beams of eternity let us follow the example let us make no attempt to know the absolute if you have discovered a comforting hypothesis even in the upper transcendental air drag it quickly to earth where laboring men forever await even an imaginary relief from their lot we must make use of everything even of death to serve the ends of this life of ours thirty eight the future a clever reasonable boy accustomed to trust his common sense read in a book for children a description of a shipwreck which occurred just as the passengers were eating their sweets at dessert he was astonished to learn that everyone women and children as well who could give no assistance whatever in saving the ship left their dessert and rushed on deck with wailing and tears why wail why rush about why be stupidly agitated the crew knew their business and would do all that could be done if you are going to perish perish you will no matter how you scream it seemed to the boy that if he had been on the ship he would just have gone on eating his sweets to the last moment justice should be done to this judicious and irreproachable opinion there remained only a few minutes to live would it not have been better to enjoy them the logic is perfect worthy of aristotle and it was found impossible to prove to the boy that he would have left his sweets even his favorite sweets under the same circumstances and rushed and screamed with the rest hence a moral do not decide about the future today common sense is uppermost and sweets are your highest law but tomorrow you will get rid of normality and sense 
you will link on with nonsense and absurdity and probably you will even get a taste for bitters what do you think thirty nine a priori synthetic judgments kant as we know found in mathematics and the natural sciences a priori synthetic judgments was he right or wrong are the judgments he indicated a priori or a posteriori anyhow one thing is certain they are not accepted as absolutely but only as relatively indisputable in metaphysics where the only curious and important truths are hidden the case is different kant was compelled to admit that just where metaphysics begin the capacity of our human reason to judge a priori ends but since we cannot dispense with metaphysical judgments he proposed to substitute for them postulates at the same time he admitted the optimistic presupposition that in the domain of the transcendental we shall find all that we miss in the world of phenomena so that because he could not invent a truly scientific metaphysics he contrived to present us with a non-scientific sort which is to say after many roundabout journeys he brings his readers along the opposite way right back to the very spot from which he led them off surely non-scientific metaphysics existed before kant the medieval philosophers had plenty of fantasies and speculations all supported by moral proofs if kant wanted to reform metaphysics he should have got rid of its favorite method of obtaining truths through inferential conclusions men are greedy they want to learn much and get their knowledge cheap so they think that every truth they have paid for with experience and loss of energy entitles them to a few more truths gratis or in philosophic language a priori by deduction they are not ashamed to speculate with a gift that has been given them instead of looking listening touching seeking they want to infer and conclude certainly if they could wring any secret out of nature no matter by what means cunning impudence fraud we would forgive them conquerors are not judged but nothing comes of their conclusions save metaphysical systems and empty prattle it is surely time to give up conclusions and get truth a posteriori as did shakespeare goethe dostoevsky that is every time you want to know anything go and look and find out and if one is lazy or horrified at a new experiment let him train himself to look on ultimate questions with indifference as the positivists do but moral ontological and such like arguments really it is disgusting to talk about them every new experiment is interesting but our conclusions that is synthetic judgments a priori are mostly pompous lies not worth the scrap of paper on which they are recorded forty general rules people go to philosophers for general principles and since philosophers are human they are kept busy supplying the market with general principles but what sense is there in them none at all nature demands individual creative activity from us men won't understand this so they wait forever for the ultimate truths from philosophy which they will never get why should not every grown-up person be a creator live in his own way at his own risk and have his own experience children and raw youths must go in leading strings but adult people who want to feel the reins should be despised they are cowards and slothful afraid to try they eternally go to the wise for advice and the wise do not hesitate to take the responsibility for the lives of others they invent general rules as if they had access to the sources of knowledge what foolery the wise are no wiser than the stupid they have only more conceit and effrontery every intelligent man laughs in his soul at bookish views and are not books the work of the wise they are often extremely interesting but only in so far as they do not contain general rules woe to him who would build up his life according to hegel schopenhauer tolstoy schiller or dostoevsky he must read them but he must have sense the mind of his own to live with those who have tried to live according to theories from books have found this out at the best their efforts produce banality there is no alternative whether man likes or not he will at last have to realize that clichés are worthless and that he must live from himself there are no all-binding universal judgments let us manage with non-binding non-universal ones only professors will suffer for it end of part two section forty
Part two, sections forty one through forty four of All Things Are Possible by Lev Shestov, section forty one. Metaphysical consolations. Metaphysics mercilessly persecutes all eudemonistic doctrines, seeing in them a sort of lysio majestatis of human dignity. Our dignity forbids us to place human happiness in the highest goal. Suppose it is so. But why then invent consolations, even metaphysical ones? Why give to such a pure ideal concept of metaphysics such a coarse sensual partner as consolation? Sensual in the Kantian meaning of the word. Metaphysics had much better associate herself with proud disconsolation. Consolation brings calm and ease, even quiet gratification to the soul but surely if metaphysics condescend to accept any assistance whatever she must scorn all earthly gratifications leave them to wingless positivism and materialism what are joys and pains to metaphysics she is one thing they another yet all of a sudden metaphysicians begin to shout about consolations evidently there is a misunderstanding here and a big one the more you pierce to the ultimate ends of the infinite metaphysical problems, the more finite they reveal themselves. Metaphysicians only look out for some new boon, I nearly said pleasure. Voltaire said that if there was no God, then he should be invented. We explain these words by the great Frenchman's extreme positivism. But the form only is positive, the content is purely metaphysical all that a metaphysician wants to do is to convince himself that god exists no matter whether he is mistaken or not he has found a consolation it is impossible for him to see that his belief in a certain fact does not make that fact veritable the whole question is whether there does exist a supreme conscious first cause or whether we are slaves to the laws of dead necessity but what does the metaphysician care about this real question having declared himself the avowed enemy of eudaimonism he next seeks consolation nothing but consolation to doubt his right to be consoled drives him to fury and madness he is prepared to support his convictions by every means ranging from righteous indignation to fists it is obviously futile to try to enlighten such a creature once a man cares nothing for god and seeks only to make the best of his life you will not tear away his attention from the immediate moment but perhaps there is a god and neither voltaire nor the metaphysicians have any need to invent him the metaphysicians never saw that an avowed disbelief in god does not prove the non-existence of god but just the opposite it is a surer sign of faith than ever belief is unfortunate metaphysicians they might have found their greatest consolation here and fists and moral indignation and other forms of chastisement to which they have been driven might have been spared us forty two practical advice people who read much must always keep in mind that life is one thing literature another not that authors invariably lie i declare that there are writers who rarely and most reluctantly lie but one must know how to read and that isn't easy out of a hundred book readers ninety-nine have no idea what they are reading about it is a common belief for example that any writer who sings of suffering must be ready at all times to open his arms to the weary and heavy laden this is what his readers feel when they read his books then when they approach him with their woes and find that he runs away without looking back at them they are filled with indignation and talk of the discrepancy between word and deed whereas the fact is the singer has more than enough woes of his own and he sings them because he can't get rid of them the bird sings in the cage not from joy but from rage says the italian proverb it is impossible to love sufferers particularly hopeless sufferers and whoever says otherwise is a deliberate liar come unto me all ye that labour and are heavy laden and i will give you rest but you remember what the jews said about him he speaks as one having authority and if jesus had been unable or had not possessed the right to answer this sceptical taunt he would have had to renounce his words we common mortals have neither divine powers nor divine rights we can only love our neighbours whilst they still have hope and any pretence of going beyond this is empty swagger 
ask him who sings of suffering for nothing but his songs rather think of alleviating his burden than of requiring alleviation from him surely not forever should we ask any poet to sob and look upon tears i will end with another italian saying no dog so wretched but he wags his tail sometimes forty three if a patient fulfils all the orders of a sensible doctor we say he behaves wisely if he wantonly neglects his treatment we say he acts stupidly if a healthy person wished to inoculate himself with some dangerous disease say phthisis we should say he was mad and forcibly restrain him to such an extent are we convinced that disease is evil health good well on what is our conviction based at a glance the question seems absurd but then at a glance people would absolutely refuse to doubt the fixity of the earth at a glance an ordinary person would giggle if he was shown the problem of the relation between the real world and the ideal who knows what would seem amenable to discussion to the ordinary person the philosopher has no right to appeal to the ordinary person the philosopher must doubt and doubt and doubt and question when nobody questions and risk making a laughing-stock of himself if common sense were enough to settle all problems we should have known everything long ago so that why do we value health more than sickness or even further which is better health or sickness if we will drop the utilitarian point of view and all are agreed that this has no place in philosophy then we shall see at once that we have no grounds whatever for preferring health and sickness we have invented neither the one nor the other we found them both in the world along with us why then do we who know so little about it take upon ourselves to judge which are nature's successes which her failures health is agreeable sickness disagreeable but this consideration is unworthy of a philosopher otherwise why be a philosopher why distinguish oneself from the herd the philosopher invented morality which has at its disposal various pure ideas which have no relation to empirical life then let us go further reason should have a supply of pure ideas also let reason judge in her own independent way without conforming to conventional ideas when she has no other resort let her proceed by the method of negation everything that common sense asserts i reason declare to be false so common sense says sickness is bad reason therefore asserts that sickness is the highest boon such reason we should call autonomous law unto itself like a real monarch it is guided only by its own will let all considerations point in favour of health reason must remain inexorable and keep her stand till we are all brought to obedience she must praise suffering deformity failure hopelessness at every step she must fight common sense and utilitarianism until mankind is brought under is she afraid of rebellion must she in the last issue like morality adapt herself to the inclinations of the mob forty four experience and science as we are well aware science does not nay cannot admit experience in all its extent she throws overboard an enormous quantity of individual facts regarding them as the ballast of our human vessel she takes note only of such phenomena as alternate constantly and with a certain regularity best of all she likes those phenomena which can be artificially provoked when so to speak experiment is possible she explains the rotation of the earth and succession of the seasons since a regular recurrence is observable and she demonstrates thunder and lightning with a spark from an electric machine in a word in so far as a regular alternation of phenomena is observable so far extends the realm of science but what about those individual phenomena which do not recur and which cannot be artificially provoked if all men were blind and one for a moment recovered his sight and opened his eyes on god's world science would reject his evidence yet the evidence of one seeing man is worth that of a million blind sudden enlightenments are possible in our life even if they endure only for a few seconds must they be passed over in silence because they are not normal and cannot be provoked or treated poetically as beautiful fictions science insists on it she declares that no judgments are true except such as can be verified by all and every one she exceeds her bounds experience is wider than scientific experiment and individual phenomena mean much more to us than the constantly recurrent science is useful but she need not pretend to truth 
she cannot know what truth is she can only accumulate universal laws whereas there are and always have been non-scientific ways of searching for truth ways which lead if not to the innermost secrets yet to the threshold these roads however we have let fall into ruin whilst we followed our modern methodologies so now we dare not even think of them what gives us the right to assert that astrologers alchemists diviners and sorcerers who passed the long nights alone with their thoughts wasted their time in vain as for the philosopher's stone that was merely a plausible excuse invented to satisfy the uninitiated could an alchemist dare to confess openly that all his efforts were towards no useful or utilitarian end he had to guard against importunate curiosity and impertinent authority in outsiders so he lied now frightening now alluring the mob through its cupidity but certainly he had his own important work to do and it had only one fault that it was purely personal to him and about personal matters it is considered correct to keep silent astonishing fact as a rule a man hesitates over trifles but it does sometimes occur that a moment arrives when he is filled with unheard-of courage and resolution in his judgments he is ready to stand up for his opinions against all the world dead or living whence such sudden surety what does it mean rationally we can discover no foundation for it if a lover has got into his head that his beloved is the fairest woman on earth worth the whole of life to him if one who has been insulted feels that his offender is the basest wretch deserving torture and death if a would-be columbus persuades himself that america is the only goal for his ambition who will convince such men that their opinions shared by none but themselves are false or unjustifiable and for whose sake will they renounce their tenets for the sake of objective truth that is for the pleasure of the assurance that all men after them will repeat their judgment for truth they don't care let don quixote run broadcast with drawn sword proving the beauty of dulcinea or the impending horror of windmills as a matter of fact he and the german philosophers with him have a vague idea a kind of presentiment that their giants are but mill sails and that their ideal on the whole is but a common girl driving swine to pasture to defy such deadly doubt they take to the sword or to argument and do not rest until they have succeeded in stopping the mouth of everybody when from all lips they hear the praise of dulcinea they say yes she is beautiful and she never drove pigs when the world beholds their windmilling exploits with amazement they are filled with triumph sheep are not sheep mills are not mills as you might imagine they are knights and cyclops this is called a proven all-binding universal truth the support of the mob is a necessary condition of the existence of modern philosophy and its knights of the woeful countenance scientific philosophy wearies for a new cervantes who will put a stop to its paving the way to truth by dint of argument all opinions have a right to exist and if we speak of privilege then preference should be given to such as are most run down to-day namely to such opinions as cannot be verified and which are for that self-same reason universal once long ago man invented speech in order to express his real relation to the universe so he may be heard even though the relation he wishes to express be unique not to be verified by any other individual to attempt to verify it by observations and experiments is strictly forbidden if the habit of objective verification has destroyed your native receptivity to such an extent that your eyes and ears are gone and you must rely only on the evidence of instruments or objects not subject to your will then of course nothing is left you but to stick to the belief that science is perfect knowledge but if your eyes live and your ear is sensitive throw away instruments and apparatuses forget methodology and scientific don quixotism and try to trust yourself what harm is there in not having universal judgments or truths how will it hurt you to see sheep as sheep it is a step forward you will learn not to see with everybody's eyes but to see as none other sees you will learn not to meditate but to conjure up and call forth with words alien to all but yourself an unknown beauty and an unheard-of power not for nothing i repeat did astrologers and alchemists scorn the experimental method which by the way far from being anything new or particularly modern is as old as the hills animals experiment 
though they do not compose treatises on inductive logic or pride themselves on their reasoning powers a cow who has burnt her mouth in her trough will come up cautiously next time to feed every experimenter is the same only he systematizes but animals can often trust to instinct when experience is lacking and have we humans got sufficient experience can experience give us what we want most if so let science and craftsmanship serve our everyday need let even philosophy also eager to serve go on finding universal truths but beyond craft science and philosophy there is another region of knowledge through all the ages men each one at his own risk have sought to penetrate into this region shall we men of the twentieth century voluntarily renounce our supreme powers and rights and because public opinion demands it occupy ourselves exclusively with discovering useful information or in order not to appear mean or poverty-stricken in our own eyes shall we accept in place of the philosopher's stone our modern metaphysics which muffles her dread of actuality in postulates absolutes and such like apparently transcendental paraphernalia end of part two section forty four part two sections forty five and forty six of all things are possible by lev shestov section forty five the russian spirit it will easily be admitted that the distinguishing qualities of russian literature and of russian art in general are simplicity truthfulness and complete lack of rhetorical ornament whether it be to our credit or to our discredit is not for me to judge but one thing seems certain that our simplicity and truthfulness are due to our relatively scanty culture whilst european thinkers have for centuries been beating their brains over insoluble problems we have only just begun to try our powers we have no failures behind us the fathers of the profoundest russian writers were either landowners dividing their time between extravagant amusement and state service or peasants whose drudgery left them no time for idle curiosity such being the case how can we know whether human knowledge has any limits and if we don't know it seems to us it is only because we haven't tried to find it out other people's experience is not ours we are not bound by their conclusions indeed what do we know of the experience of others save what we gather very vaguely and fragmentarily and unreliably from books it is natural for us to believe the best till the contrary is proved to us any attempt to deprive us of our belief meets with the most energetic resistance the most skeptical russian hides a hope at the bottom of his soul hence our fearlessness of the truth realistic truth which so stunned european critics realism was invented in the west established there as a theory but in the west to counteract it were invented numberless other palliating theories whose business it was to soften down the disconsolate conclusions of realism there in europe they have the etre supreme the deus sive natura hegel's absolute kant's postulates english utilitarianism progress humanitarianism hundreds of philosophic and sociological theories in which even extreme realists can so cleverly dish up what they call life that life or realism ceases to be life or reality altogether the westerner is self-reliant he knows that if he doesn't help himself nobody will help him so he directs all his thoughts to making the best of his opportunities a limited time is granted him if he can't get to the end of his song within the time limit the song must remain unsung fate will not give him one minute's grace for the unbeaten bars therefore as an experienced musician he adapts himself superbly not a second is wasted the tempo must not drag for an instant or he is lost the tempo is everything and it exacts facility and quickness of movement during a few short beats the artist must produce many notes and produce them so as to leave the impression that he was not hurried that he had all the time in the world at his disposal moreover each note must be complete accomplished have its fullness and its value native talent alone will not suffice for this experience is necessary tradition training and inherited instinct carpe diem the european has been living up to the motto for two thousand years 
but if we russians are convinced of anything it is that we have time enough and to spare to count days much less hours and minutes find me the russian who could demean himself to such a bourgeois occupation we look round we stretch ourselves we rub our eyes we want first of all to decide what we shall do and how we shall do it before we can begin to live in earnest we don't choose to decide anyhow nor at second hand from fragments of other people's information it must be from our own experience with our own brains that we judge we admit no traditions in no literature has there been such a determined struggle with tradition as in ours we have wanted to re-examine everything restate everything i won't deny that our courage is drawn from our quite uncultured confidence in our own powers bielinski a half-baked undergraduate deriving his knowledge of european philosophy at third hand began a quarrel with the universe over the long-forgotten victims of philip the second and the inquisition in that quarrel is the sense and essence of all creative russian literature dostoevsky towards his end raised the same storm and the same question over the little tear of an unfortunate child a russian believes he can do anything hence he is afraid of nothing he paints life in the gloomiest colours and were you to ask him how can you accept such a life how can you reconcile yourself with such horrors of reality as have been described by all your writers from pushkin to chekhov he would answer in the words of dmitri karamazov i do not accept life this answer seems at first sight absurd since life is here impossible not to accept it but there is a sub-meaning in the reply a lingering belief in the possibility of a final triumph over evil in the strength of this belief the russian goes forth to meet his enemy he does not hide from him our sectarians immolate themselves tolstoyans and votaries of the various sects that crop up so plentifully in russia go in among the people they go god knows to what lengths destroying their own lives and the lives of others writers do not lag behind sectarians they too refuse to be prudent to count the cost or the hours minutes seconds time beats all this is so insignificant as to be invisible to the naked eye we wish to draw with a generous hand from fathomless eternity and all that is limited we leave to european bourgeoisie with few exceptions russian writers really despise the pettiness of the west even those who have admired europe most have done so because they failed most completely to understand her they did not want to understand her that is why we have always taken over european ideas in such fantastic forms take the sixties for example with its loud ideas of sobriety and modest outlook it was a most drunken period those who awaited the new messiah and the second advent read darwin and dissected frogs it is the same today we allow ourselves the greatest luxury that man can dream of sincerity truthfulness as if we were spiritual crises as if we had plenty of everything could afford to let everything be seen ashamed of nothing but even Croesuses, the greatest sovereigns of the world did not consider they had the right to tell the truth at all times even kings have to pretend think of diplomacy whereas we think we may speak the truth and the truth only that any lie which obscures our true substance is a crime since our true substance is the world's finest treasure its finest reality tell this to a european and it will seem a joke to him even if he can grasp it at all a european uses all his powers of intellect and talent all his knowledge and his art for the purpose of concealing his real self and all that really affects him for that the natural is ugly and repulsive no one in europe will dispute for a moment not only the fine arts but science and philosophy in europe tell lies instinctively by lying they justify their existence first and last a european student presents you with a finished theory well and what does all the finish and the completeness signify it merely means that none of our western neighbours will end his speech before the last reassuring word is said he will never let nature have the last word so he rounds off his synthesis with him ornament and rhetoric is a sine qua non of creative utterance the only remedy against all ills in philosophy reigns theodicy in science the law of sequence even kant could not avoid declamation even with him the last word is moral necessity 
thus there lies before us the choice between the artistic and accomplished lie of old cultured europe a lie which is the outcome of a thousand years of hard and bitter effort and the artless sincere simplicity of young uncultured russia they are nearer the end we are nearer the beginning and which is nearer the truth and can there be a question of voluntary free choice probably neither the old age of europe nor the youth of russia can give us the truth we seek but does such a thing as ultimate truth exist is not the very conception of truth the very assumption of the possibility of truth merely an outcome of our limited experience a fruit of limitation we decide a priori that one thing must be possible another impossible and from our arbitrary assumptions we proceed to deduce the body of truth each one judges in his own way according to his powers and the conditions of his existence the timid scared man worries after order that will give him a day of peace and quiet youth dreams of beauty and brilliance old age doesn't want to think of anything having lost the faculty for hope and so it goes on ad infinitum and this is called truth truths every man thinks that his own experience covers the whole range of life and therefore the only men who turn out to be at all in the right are empiricists and positivists there can be no question of truth once we tear ourselves away from the actual conditions of life our confident truthfulness like european rhetoric turns out to be beyond truth and falsehood the young east and the old west alike suffer from the restrictions imposed by truth but the former ignores the restrictions whilst the latter adapts itself to them after all it comes to pretty much the same in the end is not clever rhetoric as delightful as truthfulness each is equally life only we find unendurable a rhetoric which poses as truth and a truthfulness which would appear cultured such a masquerade would try to make us believe that truth which is only limitedness has a real objective existence which is offensive until the contrary is proved we need to think that only one assertion has or can have any objective reality that nothing on earth is impossible every time somebody wants to force us to admit that there are other more limited and limiting truths we must resist with every means we can lay our hands on we do not hesitate even to make use of morality and logic both of which we have abused so often but why not use them when a man is at his last resources he does not care what weapons he picks up forty six nur für schwindelfreie to be proper i ought to finish with a moral i ought to say to the reader that in spite of all i have said or perhaps because of all i have said for in conclusions as you are aware in spite of is always interchangeable with because of particularly if the conclusion be drawn from many scattered data well then because of all i have said hope is not lost every destruction leads to construction sweet rest follows labor dawn follows the darkest hour and so on and so on and so on all the banalities with which a writer reconciles his reader but it is never too late for reconciliation and it is often too early so why not postpone the moral for a few years even a few dozen years god granting us the length of life why make the inevitable conclusion at the end of every book i am almost certain that sooner or later i can promise the reader all his heart desires but not yet he may of course dispense with my consolations what do promises matter anyhow especially when neither reader nor writer can fulfil them but if there is no escape if a writer is finally obliged to admit in everybody's hearing that the secret desires of poor mankind may yet be realized let us at least give the wretched writer a respite let him postpone his confession till old age usque ad infinitum meanwhile our motto nur for schwindelfreie there are in the alps narrow precipitous paths where only mountaineers may go who feel no giddiness giddy free only for the giddy free it says on the notice board he who is subject to giddiness takes a broad safe road or sits away below and admires the snowy summits is it inevitably necessary to mount up beyond the snow line are no fat pastures nor gold fields they say that up there is to be found the clue to the eternal mystery but they say so many things we can't believe everything he who is tired of the valleys loves climbing 
and is not afraid to look down a precipice and most of all has nothing left in life but the metaphysical craving he will certainly climb to the summits without asking what awaits him there he does not fear he longs for giddiness but he will hardly call people after him he doesn't want just anybody for a companion in such a case companions are not wanted at all much less those tender-footed ones who are used to every convenience roads street lamps guide-posts careful maps which mark every change in the road ahead they will not help only hinder they will prove superfluous heavy ballast which may not be thrown overboard fuss over them console them promise them who would be bothered is it not better to go one's way alone and not only to refrain from enticing others to follow but frighten them off as much as possible exaggerate every danger and difficulty in order that conscience may not prick too hard we who love high altitudes love a quiet conscience let us find a justification for their inactivity let us tell them they are the best the worthiest of people really the salt of the earth let us pay them every possible mark of respect but since they are subject to giddiness they had better stay down the upper alpine ways as any guide will tell you are nur for schwindelfreie end of all things are possible by lev shestov 